Hi, good morning. Uh, this is Vincent McCrudden. I am president for Project for Government Reform. Uh, first, I wanted to thank uh, you all. Uh, yesterday, I did my introductory uh, video and YouTube video and set up my channel. And I want to thank the people that um, came, uh, witnessed it, and gave me some uh, gave me some great feedback on it. So I really appreciate that very much. Uh, actually, one of the one of the first people um, to subscribe is uh, a friend of mine by the name of uh, Shana uh, O'Toole. Um, she is founder and president of uh, the Due Process Institute. Uh, I do process, I believe it's it's called. Um, she used to work for the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Um, she's a great lady. Uh, she's one of the people that really care about people, really care about the law, uh, and is dedicating uh, her time to try to evoke change down in Washington. Uh, I, I will be uh, talking more about uh, organizations in and around Washington. Uh, one of the latest ones is a Reform Alliance with uh, Van Jones and Meek Mills and Jay-Z and such. Um, you know, just one of these uh, fraudulent uh, organizations that, that uh, plot the criminal justice uh, landscape, uh, saying they're benevolent when, when all they're doing is self-promotion. Uh, but Shana's a, a, a good person, so thank you, Shana, for... Um, subscribing and um, help me get towards a thousand subscribers, which is what I believe I I need to to at least uh, get off the map on uh, on YouTube. Um, Shana can be followed here on uh, Twitter. Uh, her Twitter account is S T R E G O N, and she's got some great material on there for for you all, uh, people who care about the law and criminal justice uh, system. So. This, my first real tutorial, educational video, is about something that I care very, very deeply about. Um, I've submitted four of them, over, uh, four or five of them over the past uh, decade. Um, it is really the only way that I know uh, to hold accountable uh, federal judges. Um, it is the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act of, of 1980. And um, it is, uh, you know, it's the only way, really. So if, if you've been in court, in federal court, you've been in there for a civil violation or a civil case uh, or a criminal case, and your judge um, has not been, you think, fair, uh, there, this, is, this is the way to try to seek accountability and justice. So you've, you've got a bad judge, okay? You know it, he's biased, he's prejudiced against you, and uh, you want to do something about it. So this is your way to do something about it. Uh, no, no, you're not going to see Judge Judy in uh, federal court. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is, this is more along the lines of uh, what you'll see in federal court. Uh, this is this will be your normal magistrate or district court judge uh, who is going to determine the law. He's supposed to be an impartial, independent, uh, fair tribunal, uh, just basically making sure that the process goes uh, according to law. And he's going to make those uh, lawful uh, determinations uh, according to the constitutions. Uh, if that's what you believe, which I believed uh, growing up, then uh, good luck. Good luck to you. So uh, the basis uh, for the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act of 1980 is this right here. Um, it establishes a process by which any person can file a complaint alleging a federal judge has engaged in conduct prejudicial to the effective and expeditious administration of the business of the courts. Sounds reasonable, right? Or he's uh, mentally uh, or physically uh, disabled, which, which would be uh, you would think would be pretty evident, um, but in a lot of cases, uh, it, it's not. So, uh, like all things in in the legal world, it sounds pretty fair. You know, it sounds like you have a you have a chance. Well, uh, you know, good luck with thinking that. This one sentence is is going to really make or break. This is their get out of jail free card. The judicial conduct and disability review process cannot be used to challenge the correctness of a judge's decision in a case. A, judge, a judicial decision that is unfavorable to a litigant does not alone establish misconduct or a disability. An attorney can explain any rights you have as a litigant to seek review of a judicial decision. 
So the first thing is uh, the, the last sentence there. Uh, uh, a lawyer is going to tell you how to get justice. Well, after he takes all your money, if you have any money left, uh, he doesn't give a shit. Uh, that, that I can tell you after 20-something years of being in federal court and both the civil and the criminal side, uh, side to it. So throw that out the window. The first sentence is the most important, and, and that is basically the get out of jail free card for federal judges. And that is basically uh, that they can use merits related uh, decisions to not hold themselves accountable. And, and that's been in my four or five cases that I've had against judicial complaints. That is their go to. Everything is merits related. Even when you, you go through the uh, statutes 30, 351 to 364 and you look at the individual uh, burdens of the federal judges, they, they'll just lump everything together uh, as merits related. So your chances of, of, of seeking accountability, um, this is number one, the only way. And number two, it's self-pleased that they basically make the decision themselves. So in my case, in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, I had this uh, fella here, uh, Robert Katzman, who actually had ruled against me in 2008. Uh, to, I had an oral argument. Well, my judge, had, my lawyer had an oral argument in 2007 on a, on a, a registration case, um, and him and Rena Raji and, and Robert Sack ruled against me. And then he became chief judge, and then he ruled against me many times after that. He actually orchestrated a lot of things behind the scenes. He, he did ex parte communications. Uh, so this is where your judicial uh, conduct and disability complaint of 1980 is going is going to or somebody like him it's going to go to your your chief judge in your circuit um oh who wrote that i like little boys uh that that well that's that's not nice i i don't know who did that but um this is the type of guy that you that you're gonna uh, have uh maybe he won't he'll have a toupee maybe he won't have a toupee but um he looks like a, a reasonable uh a fellow uh, impartial uh, independent uh you know not so then you don't like uh, somebody like the chief judge's decision. And so you're going to go uh, to uh, your, your next uh, administration uh, remedies is going to be to file an appeal to the to the judicial council. And uh, the judicial council is made up of um, other circuit judges um, that uh, sat, sit on the panel uh, with the chief judge over many, many years. They know each other very well. And, and these people are going to decide whether the magistrate or the district court judge uh, violated the the uh, laws uh, according to the, those that, that act, um, and then if the chief judge uh, didn't didn't uh, adhere uh, to the law. So uh, good luck uh, with that. Uh, that's you there, um, the complainant. That's the judicial council, and um, maybe that's not the decision you're going to get, but or, 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 or disposition uh, of being uh, a gunshot, but it's going to feel like that. So here's uh, a typical judicial uh, council. Um, they, they all act as an independent, disinterested, ob uh, objective, reasonable person aware of all the underlying facts. Um, so that's the legal language uh, that you can also throw out the window. Uh, but that's the test uh, for the judicial council that they're going to somehow look at your complaint objectively and, um, you know, and, and in most cases that that's not the case. As a matter of fact, in all my research or over the years, I've only seen one federal judge um, censured or done anything to. He was actually found liable. The, the actual complaint did go through, but he wasn't um, uh, punished uh, at all. He was allowed to retire. So you could do what I did. Uh, you can write uh, nasty letters uh, to the court. Um, that was my uh, way of protest. And you can see here that uh, that was highly successful. Um, they uh, It says here that the former Long Island man cross-examined on charges. So, um, uh, so yes, I, I was I was actually uh, charged. Um, and 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 um, oh, that's me there. Yep, uh, I was put in prison for those. Lovely letters. Um, I sent f I sent nine letters over f two years that I was doing all these uh, adjudications and had filed these uh, judicial complaints. And um, yep, they threw me in jail for four months. Um, that's that's me there at MCC in Manhattan in New York. Um, I sat there for four months and then um, 
after four months, it was found out that my all my pleadings were constitutionally protected speech. So I had a nice little vacation for four months. But uh, unlike a vacation, it doesn't look like uh, I'm too happy. So I, I don't recommend that you write nasty letters to the court. That could be deemed uh, threatening in any way. Uh, again, they're going to decide or what's threatening or not threatening, you would think that they're scholars of the law and would know the idea of what's called true threats, which is the violation of the law versus constitutionally protected speech. But as you can see, uh, they don't know their ass from their elbow. They just call up the U.S. Marshals and say, hey, arrest this guy. And the U.S. Marshals do what they're told to do. And, uh, and that's what happens. So you can see I'm not the only one. There's a lot of cases here. You see a New York City teacher uh, threatened to kill two federal judges. Actually, I think uh, Robert Katzman was uh, was one of them. Um, so I don't think Katzman's a pretty popular fella um, in the Second Circuit anyway. I'm sure anybody who's looking at this uh, in any circuit throughout the country has their own Robert Katzman. Um, they're, they're filled with them. I think they're handpicked. They might even be born uh, that way. So you say, uh, oh, well, I I'm, I'm going to go get justice. And you may pick up a few of your family uh, members. You pick up a few of your neighbors and friends and um, say, uh, let's, uh, let's get the pitchforks and, and the torches out and let's, uh, let's, burn, let's burn the damn place down to the ground. Um, I, I don't want to go back to that picture of me uh, back, but um, I don't recommend it. And there's almost a hundred percent guarantee that that mob there uh, is is probably 99% more that you're going to recruit. You're going to be the only one with a dog and uh, and a torch, and you will spend time in prison. So um, I wouldn't recommend writing nasty letters, and I wouldn't recommend uh, uh, pitchforks and torches. So this is, stepping aside for a minute, this is the foundation and the basis that actually all federal employees take. It is it is an oath that, that's taken to them and district court and magistrate judges, um, you know, adhere to this as well. And it's, uh, it, it's, you know, it's a law, it's a statute. They have to take it. Do they abide by it? Are they accountable for it? Uh, no, uh, uh, that's the true answer. So uh, this is the actual uh, code and the judicial uh, oath that um, both uh, district court magistrate judges take and uh, Supreme Court justices uh, take as well. Supreme Court justices take two oaths. And it says here that they will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties incumbent upon me uh, under the Constitution. Um, OK, you know, so 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 they took that oath. Good. Uh, good for them. So the Supreme Court justices uh, take not one but two sworn oaths to be fair and impartial, uh, to abide by the Constitution, and yet the whole reason they are nominated in the first place by either political party is their predisposition bias. Uh, and so that's played out um, every day. Um, in, in most key decisions, as everyone is aware, it's usually five to four. And uh, I believe President Trump just recently admitted that that. Um, one of the most important decisions he'll ever make is nominating Supreme Court justices. Why? Because they're the end game. They're the ones that our founding fathers uh, constructed the checks and balances. And unfortunately, over time, it is uh, morphed into something uh, not not like that. There there aren't there aren't powers, and the powers we are giving them to aren't deserved. And the the reason for this whole thing is that they're not held accountable and they're self policed, which needs to change. As you can see here, here's the balance of power at the present moment. There are considered a bias of five conservative judges and uh, four liberal judges um, who pretty much are uh, nominated and confirmed by that the party that, that nominates them. So you wonder why, why is there so much unfairness and injustice? Why is there a, l a large thinning uh, gap of wealth disparity and the poor and the middle class continually um, get fucked? Um, well, we've decided that these people, the, the, the judges, uh, both Supreme Court judges, magistrate judges, district court judges are, are the ones that um, are going to rule uh, for us or, or, or for the people. And so the question is, how's that working for you so far? 
one of the interesting things is that when you look at the makeup of Supreme Court justices, you can see that they are very much like you and me. Uh, they they come from common backgrounds. Uh, they're they're the carpenters. They're construction workers. They uh, do dishes. They provide health you know health care to people. Uh, no, they don't. They're scholars. Uh, supposed scholars, um, and they go to the most elite uh, universities that the world has to offer, not just this country. And and so they have no idea of the damage that they do to to us, you know, the small people. Um, and and more times than not, they they basically um, adhere and support the government. So uh, back to this guy, Robert Katzman. Um, you know, the other day I was reading a story and um, I saw that uh, he was he, he's asked to speak. They're, they're, they don't have a high profile out there, but he was asked to speak at a local college in New York last year. And um, he they he spoke about ethics uh, of all things. And he was asked about the Stormy Daniels situation. And Katzman simply told the students that Daniels was one example of maintaining the judicial code he follows daily. And so, you know, here here is a basic hypocritical answer, uh, just just rhetoric that gets thrown around, um, and and it's I mean I could show you examples of blatant violations of law. Um, he's overseen and his buddies have overseen 30 years of the largest incarceration in the history of mankind over the past 30 years. And so he's not ethical. He's not moral. He's not governing by the law. He's not accountable. And he's and he's allowed to self-police themselves. And so it, it must it must end. It must stop. One of the most unfortunate things is I saw in the article, one of the students said he spoke very deeply about our judicial system and the checks and balance it provides. You know, and I could just close my eyes and see myself, you know, 30, 40 years ago, believing, uh, believing in that. But after 22 years of being targeted and harassed by the federal court system, I, I, I know now exactly what it is. And that's why I'm here today telling you about what you can maybe possibly do about it, what needs to be done and what a farce it is. So basically, you know, that that's it on the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act. It's something that I, I'm very, very passionate about. Um, and, and so I've told you what, what I did, uh, rightly or wrongly. Um, you know, I, I've wrote letters. I filed complaints. I, I've both legally, I've legally followed every process that you can. And at the end of the day is what I'm testifying to you today is that there is no accountability. You know, so th this isn't a, a Khan Academy tutorial. This isn't a math pro, uh, problem or a science problem that has definitive answers. Um, this is totally subjective, and it's up to you to go out there. You know, um, what you could do is you can reach out to me, or you can share. You know, what I hope you would do is share this tutorial on on our system on on this specific judicial conduct and disability after 1980 and and what you can do about it you know you can write senators and congressmen like i have done over the years i've gone down i've talked to them and they typically don't don't care as well what when is it way one to the other when when it's dire that you need to do something but uh, if, if we're going to hold, if we're going to allow these people to be the end all, the end of, of rule, the end of our democracy and our republic and government, then we they need to be held accountable. We need to change this law immediately. So um, whatever way you decide to do that, whether you want to be Mohammed Bouzizi and light yourself on fire in front of the Supreme Court, you know, go for it. You know, if it brings attention, I, I don't think it will. This country uh, just doesn't want to uh, protest or uh, have any ci civil disobedience, primarily because, as you can see, you get thrown in prison. Um, you can go down to Washington or wherever you want to go to and talk to your elected officials. I don't think that's going to work either unless you go in large numbers. And, and how that's done, I don't know because we're such a, a diverse country. But so I'm sorry to leave it open-ended. I've shared with you the laws, the pursuit of what you can do, what I've done, the penalties that me and my family have suffered. So it's up to you. Um, and that's why I present it to you. I wish you good luck and thank you for listening. I, I hope you continue su to subscribe and share it with other people so that people can be informed. Thank you very much. See you soon.